Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the LFC Transfer Room. My name is Lewis, and we're here with another episode of our Expert Analysis Series, a show where we bring in football and Liverpool's top content creators and get their thoughts on all things to do with football, Liverpool, and just all life in general, to be honest. And today, we're joined by another mainstay of the Liverpool content creation scene, Liverpool Cricket Club bowler, marathon runner, and Red Men TV mainstay it is Dan Club. Dan, thank you very much for coming on. You're good. Yeah, mate, I'm all good. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I don't know what to say. I'm a little bit embarrassed now, but no, thanks all for having me, mate. I massively appreciate it. And yeah, looking forward to it. Well, I suppose we'll we'll get started. Been a busy busy few weeks, to be honest, on regards to Liverpool and Liverpool front. Just a quick one. Happy with the result last night. What are your thoughts about the match against Sparta? Yeah, um, happy with the result, definitely. Uh, I think if we were to really sort of unpack the performance, there was a, a fair amount of negatives in the it. I think it's fair to say, I think Jurgen Klopp alluded to something similar in his post-match assessment last night because, yeah, it was far from perfect. It was far from watertight from a defensive standpoint. But, listen, if you offer me a four-goal advantage heading into a second leg at Anfield, I'd, uh, I'd bite your hand up every time. Sort of how we navigated our way to that remains in question. But ultimately, like I say, a 5-1 victory away from home in any competition, let alone in the knockout phase of the European competition. That's a pretty impressive night's work. So, yeah, relatively pleased, I think it's fair to say. I mean, I saw Steve tweet out something that was saying that was a really strange half that at the end of the first half. And it was, like you said, we didn't feel very in control. There were moments where we looked very susceptible on the counter. I mean, like you said, then uh, it wasn't like a perfect performance. But if you were to give it a mark out of 10, what would you sort of say? Yeah, again, ultimately, you know, you have to sort of separate the two conversations, don't you? Because performance wise, it's probably like I think a six and a half, maybe out of 10. But when you factor in the result, it suddenly bumps you up to more like an eight and a half, even a nine potentially, because it is such a such a chasm of an advantage we're taking to Anfield. Mm-hmm. Like you're right, we were very susceptible. I think we called on Keith Kelleher probably two, three, four, five too many times, and we would have potentially have liked him, but he was exceptional. I think it's fair to say, but yeah, definitely some uh, some issues arising from the game that we need to be ironed out quickly. But if you are going to have a bit of an off night, having it in a game whereby you yourself you're going to create five, six, seven, eight, nine chances and take five of them, that's probably the night to do it. Plus, you factor in the fact that Sparta Park weren't exactly lethal in front of goal. It's probably a good night to yeah. not quite be at it. So if I was going to number it, like I say, it probably would be an 8.5, which sounds low for a 5-1 win. But when you factor in the fact we weren't actually that good, it's probably about right. Yeah, yeah I mean, if, the, if it was that kind of performance against, say, you know, touch wood, but City on Sunday probably wouldn't have got out of it in the same position that we are now. So we should be very thankful that we are. Um, So, yeah, I just, I've got quite a few things I want to touch on you on, Dan, because I think on the Redmen side of things, you're a very, I said the same sort of thing to Chris, you're a very analytical person. You're very sort of detailed in the fact of you look behind the scenes, you like to discuss a lot of details of the inner mechanism of Liverpool. And recently you did an interview with Dave Powell. Uh, You discussed the idea of Michael Edwards returning to Liverpool and the sort of overriding feeling seemed to be, you know, it probably wasn't on the cards. It's not something we should be looking at too much. However, past 24 hours we've been seeing developments. He's in talks with FSG about bringing him into a higher role and with Richard Hughes leaving Bournemouth as well, that could be something that factors into it. I mean, what do you make of the move and is there anything to say the fact that because Richard Hughes isn't leaving until the end of the season, that might be leaving it a little bit too late, especially with a new manager coming in. Yeah, quite possibly, because all of the all of the, the noise out of Liverpool, really, and anyone you speak to in that sphere, is that the sporting director will be the precursor to the manager appointment. So I think the fact that Richard Hughes, if he was to be our next sporting director, that not happening until sort of the end of May time feels a little bit late to me, because I think we'd like to have the manager in situ, potentially beforehand, certainly a good nod towards who the manager was going to be. And now some may argue we already have that because I think we're all pretty much nailed on expecting it to be Xabi Alonso in some way, shape or form. We're certainly hoping that's going to be the case anyway. Um, but yeah, I think the Edward stuff is really fascinating. And I like to I like to try and get a bit of a bit of a steer on why we're going after Michael Edwards. And I like to get a bit of a, a clue as to why we did a lot of things behind the scenes. I think it's important that more than ever now, 
I think football fans, and I obviously as a Liverpool fan, are interested in warts and all a little bit and what is going on behind the scenes and why are these conversations, why are these decisions getting made? So I like to sort of try and get a little bit of insight into that if I possibly can. And Dave is brilliant for that, as are many of the people that I speak to as well. But in terms of Edwards, I think... I think getting him back in the building in some capacity would be really impressive and really positive because we all know we all herald him for the job he did um, during his time at Liverpool, obviously in a sporting director role. And they find it really interesting that FSG are so desperate to do so. Clearly, they have a very high opinion of him and the way he operates and stuff like that. And the fact that I'm willing to move heaven and earth and essentially make up a role for him makes you wonder just how highly do they rate him and just how desperate are they for him, you'd imagine very. So it's really interesting. But as I say, I think in terms of sporting directly, in terms of a lot of these decisions, to be honest, like I think there needs to be a bit more urgency to it for want of like a better and more detailed explanation because, yeah, it's March and yet on-field matters remain sort of the priority. And interestingly, Dave kind of said to me, he said, FSG are relatively sort of content and they don't want to rock the boat too much because things are moving along well. Of course, the quadruple hunt remains possible. At the same time, there has to be some clarity on the future, I think it's fair to say, at some point. And it can't drag on too long because we're not too far removed from sort of transfer conversations needed to be happening. Contracts in particular are probably the biggest one in amongst all of this because the manager's one thing, but I think... Getting Trent, Virgil van Dijk and Mo Salah, probably most importantly, either tied down to new contracts or not, as the case may be. They're all things that come under the wing of your sporting director. So not having one in place feels a bit remiss. For, for That feels harsh to say, but it also kind of is true as well. Sort of like a, a fail to prepare, prepare to fail kind of thing. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Now... Obviously, you touched on there, and there's a lot to go into. This, for the first time in a long time, feels like it's a bit of turmoil. Not turmoil might be the wrong word, but it does feel like for the first time, like you mentioned before, rocking the boat's happening. We're losing a lot of staff. There's a big change behind the scenes. Players' contracts are coming down, and we've seen what that does to the clubs like Manchester United, for example, bringing these players' contracts run out, Arsenal over the years. I mean, is there a sense of... And it's just to sort of play devil's advocate, but if Michael Edwards coming back, is that a sort of Liverpool going back to what they know kind of thing now that Klopp's leaving or a lot of the staff are? A sort of like a comfort blanket in a sense, stick with what you know works? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, 100%. Because clearly there's a trust element in all of this. And FSG have implicit trust in Jürgen Klopp, quite clearly. And now that Jürgen Klopp is leaving, that person at the helm, at the very heartbeat of the football club, won't be there anymore. Therefore, they're looking to replace that and they can't replace that in managerial terms because that doesn't exist. Whoever comes in as the manager will be a relative unknown, certainly to FSG. So therefore, they're looking for somebody they know they can give they can give the keys to Liverpool Football Club to, basically. From a football perspective, obviously, there's commercial people, there's Mike Gordon. They have got the day-to-day running of the whole operation down to a T. But from the football side of things, they need somebody they know will make the right decision and get things right time and time again. And who is that? It's Michael Edwards. Because Julian Ward's tenure, you know, however you want to look at that, why the decision was made that he would leave is by the by, really. It never proved to be ultimately successful and it wasn't very long. He would be the next option because he was at the club for a long time, underneath Michael Edwards, of course. However, Michael Edwards is the gold standard in this conversation. He just absolutely is. And it's no surprise to me said earlier on, it's no surprise to me that the football club FSG are desperate to get him back in the building, so much so that although Dave Powell did sort of reference that his opinion and the conversations he's had are leaning towards Michael Edwards not returning because he's willing, he's more keen to focus on his own business now, which is absolutely fair enough. But he did also go on to say that like FSG are so desperate to get him that they might offer him similar things to the offer Theo Epstein, which is like equity in FSG itself, like above and beyond your normal role and above and beyond your normal job. Not to going to pay him a wage, essentially. They're going to offer him future shares in what is a global enterprise. So if that appeals to Michael Edwards, who knows, we might be able to convince him. And it feels like, you know, Michael Edwards isn't chomping at the bit to return to Liverpool, but if the offer's too good to refuse, again, for want of a better expression, he might just do it. <laughs> 
I mean, like, is that not... It, I'd love to have Edwards back, but it needs to sort of be in the benefit of the club, which, of course, it would be. But given how shrewd FSG are with their money, I mean, could could it be viewed as, by some, a sort of sign of weakness, so to speak, and for Michael Edwards to come in and say, you know, I want this and this and this, you'll give me sort of whatever I want kind of thing? Yeah, possibly. I get that. And it might be seen, yeah, as a little bit... It smacks almost of desperation. It's like on the cusp of desperation. Mm. If, if they're that keen to get somebody in and they don't see there's a real viable alternative, then, yeah, maybe there is an element of that in there. However, and again, it brings me back to the point I made earlier, like, clearly they rate him so, so highly. And they almost see Absolutely. it as a, as a smart financial decision to give him the keys to the kingdom. Because they know they're going to leave it in such safe hands that everything then that follows from a footballing point of view will work. He'll get the decisions right time and time again. So he's almost like an investment piece. And they're so willing to accept that that they'll give him basically what he wants because they know in the long run it'll prove to be a smart decision. So once again, it brings me back to Michael Edwards being a semi-genius when it comes to this sort of stuff. Well, I mean, we, I, like you say, we keep it, it keeps going back to it. all roads lead to Rome, and all of them seem to go back to Michael Edwards just being this outstanding figurehead in football. I want to go sort of to the FSG side of things because I've I've spoke to Steve about it, I've spoke to Chris about it, and I don't think there's anyone really better to get an opinion on FSG as someone like you, who's very, like I said before, you enjoy the background work and it's a lot more than say your average fan sort of would. What do you make of the FSG time at Liverpool? Like I'm of the camp of. I quite enjoy them in the sense of, yeah, there's times where they probably could have been a bit more splashed with the cash at points, but they've built a very sustainable long-term future for the club as opposed to someone like the Glazers or like Todd Bowley's doing at Chelsea. I mean, what what do you make of their time during at Liverpool? Well, I think the first thing to say is I think we're in safe hands. Um, that's yeah. that's a blessing in itself because, you know, myself, I, I, I like to stay the cross things, all, thing, all things Liverpool throughout my whole footballing fandom, essentially. Um, and obviously Hicks and Gillette were very much not in safe hands during their um, troubled ownership, let's put it that way. Um, so yeah, FSG have definitely sort of restabilised and some the, the safety of the football club, which is massively important. However, to address the transfer dealings thing, so first, first and foremost, I would have liked to, them to have spent more money in the past. I'd like them to put mm. their hand in their own pocket more, if I'm being really honest. I think the sustainable sell to buy model has been an effective one and it's worked as a tool. It's worked as a mechanism only when we've had Philip Coutinho stroke Luis Suarez to sell and we've had sort of real big outgoings. I think the sales of fringe players has been really positive as well. When you factor in your Dom Solankis, your Nico Williams is of this world, you've been able to generate good money for them, which has then been reinvested into the transfer market. It seems to be... It's when we're desperate, and there has been times during FSG's tenure, we've been desperate for the transfer. We hark back to the uh, the window whereby we need a centre-back desperately and ended up, ended up with Ben Davies and Ozan Kabak. And you think, if that was most other football clubs, not all necessarily, they might have been a bit more willing to splash 30, 40 million on a centre-back who could well have solved the ailments that we had back there. And ultimately, it wasn't even those two that did. It was, it was Nat Phillips and Luke Williams. But that's when FSG's model and FSG's way does certainly come under question. And that's when I understand the scrutiny of certain parts of the fan base. And also, on top of that, FSG have made some missteps along the way. Like, let's not beat around the bush. Like, ticket prices, trademark in Liverpool, furloughs a conversation within itself. Like, and the Super League being probably the biggest one amongst all of this as well. They've, they've been far, far from perfect. Um, absolutely far from perfect. However, I come back to what I said earlier, you know, the commercial success of Liverpool Football Club now is is gone through the stratosphere, essentially, in recent times. Appointing Jurgen Klopp um, wasn't a bad decision either, was it? Let's be honest. Um, <laughs> some of the transfers have been really, really shrewd. Some of the transfers have been really, really impactful. Um, when you look at the money we spent on the likes of Mohamed Salah and stuff like that, the, the, uh, the value and the bargain element of that is absolutely outstanding. And I, I like the way Liverpool have operated. And it's a big talking point at the moment. With obviously, Trent adding fuels to that particular fire with is sort of this yeah. means more 
element of it because Liverpool, the way we do stuff, and I get that, and I'm sort of on board with that. I think that's right, and mm -hmm. Man City fans, Erling Haaland, Rodri will rail against that, of course they will, but that's my opinion as well. I share that opinion with Trent. It does mean more to me because of the way we've gone about it and the way we've had to compete with a state-funded football club, essentially. I think it's been remarkable, and I'm not sure many managers in world football would have been able to achieve what Jurgen Klopp achieved because I'm I'm reticent to use the word constraint because we have spent money, of course we have, but again, the money we spend tends to be money that we generate. We're not in a world whereby if FSG say there's no money to spend in the simplistic of ter most simplistic of terms, it feels like there's no money to spend. And again, I come back to that window whereby we're pretty desperate to do something and we don't really do anything. And that just shows you that is the, the example of the way we operate. If there's not money going out of the club in terms of transfer sales, there's not money to go and spend, basically. That's kind of as simple as it gets. Yeah. But yeah, to come back to it, I think their ownership has been a successful one. And I'd be hard pressed mm -hmm. to argue against that. There's definitely been missteps along the way. There's definitely times whereby I'd wished they'd spent more money. And even the situation we're in now, obviously you mentioned it earlier, there's a relative amount of turmoil, a little bit of upheaval. There's some big decisions coming down the line as well. The way at present we're handling ourselves, and yes, I'd like it to speed up ever so slightly, but the way we're handling ourselves and the people we're getting linked to and the, the potential mm. people that could be coming into the club, Again, we're appointing best in class. If the people that I think we might get come in, of course, that could all change. We're appointing best in class. And it's very rare during FSG's time at the club that we haven't done that. Like, it really is. And that's ultimately all you can ask. Is your football club safe? Yes. Is it successful? And are the best people getting appointed into the big roles? Yes. So it's ticking boxes whilst also making some errors along the way. Well, I mean, you've got to break a few eggs at the end of the day, and I think that's what the FSG have done with a lot of it. And you touched on earlier, like, there has been times where they probably could have spent a bit more. Now, the sort of sell-to-buy model in the modern day of football with, like, FFP coming into, well, I say FFP, but, you know, all the financial matters yeah. that are coming in. Are we more prepared for it than other clubs are, given the fact that Chelsea are having to bring their spending down, United are having to bring it down, City in a sense, whereas we've always operated within the constraints of the rules? Are we in a better position than them possibly because of it? You'd certainly like to think so. I think FFP uh, or PSR, as it seems to be these days, was was absolutely integral to FSG's game plan in many senses. Like We needed an effective and an impactful FFP for Liverpool to thrive, basically. And the fact that for so many years it has been not those things. It has been a little bit wet, a bit paper thin, and people have been able to circumnavigate it time and time again has impacted Liverpool. Um, hopefully, those clubs that have been avoiding the rules, for want of um, a better way of putting it, will uh, will face their comeuppance in the near future, of course. Uh, Man City, obviously, with a lot of charges hanging over their particular heads. But, yeah, I think... If it does start to show its teeth, um, as it seems to be doing in the past few months, and it does continue to do so, and they can make it there so teams can't just essentially make a mockery of it in the future, Liverpool should be in a very strong position to capitalise upon that. Because, as you mentioned, we've been doing it anyway, commercially off the field, we're absolutely thriving. There's no two ways about that. Our commercial revenue continues to rise and, and shows no sign of slowing down whatsoever. And whilst, you know, Man City are on the pitch, certainly a huge footballing entity now, off the pitch, they don't stack up realistically compared to Liverpool and Manchester United. And Manchester United are on the wane at the moment as well and could face another year about Champions League footy. So, yeah, Liverpool are primed, I would say, to reap the benefits of an actual bona fide FFP stroke PSR ruling. However, how the Premier League come to that remains to be seen. Because even now, you know, to talk about Everton for a moment, like they obviously get their 10 point deduction and then that appears to be flaky and flimsy at best. It gets reduced to six. So they haven't quite grasped how to get a handle on all this sort of stuff. But yeah, to, to, on Liverpool, I think if they are able to do so, Liverpool have never been better placed to reap the benefits from that because we are. Again, the gold standard when it comes to how to operate in this particular field, in this particular market. We just need it to actually come to fruition, basically. 
I think that's the perfect way of saying it. And like you said, we're in a very good position. We're in a long-term secured future. Obviously, there's all the changes and stuff, but that's something that's going to get addressed very soon. I want to move on to the manager situation. Now, I know it's been spoken about to death. I know everyone's talked about Klopp leaving, and it's it's one of the worst things in a sense, but it's one of the best things for him personally. You've spoke a lot about Alonso. You've made very clear why you'd like him as the manager, and a lot of other fans have. But just for the sake of this video, what is it about him particularly that you think would allow him to thrive at Liverpool should he come in? Yeah, um, interesting one. I think, listen, there's obviously there's two elements to all of this. There's the intangibles, which is it's Xabi Alonso. Um, there's clearly a connection. There's a bond there pre-existing. There's a, an admiration for him. And there's the whole the, the throwaway party lines but they remain true oh he gets the club he understands what it means to be part of this football club and we've been very fortunate under Jurgen Klopp to have not only an incredible football manager but somebody that understands the football club understands the city as well moreover and Javi Lonzo has that already ingrained into him so I mean that's definitely a massive part of it but ultimately I've said again a little bit throw away but I've said a few times like when these rumors first started to circulate that one thing that terrifies me more than most in life right now is Xabi Alonso could be the next big thing in managerial terms. And if Liverpool don't get him and he does go to a Bayern Munich, a Real Madrid or whoever, and he ends up being the superstar manager and we miss the boat, that will haunt me forever. So I don't want to live in that world. But just in a more sort of an actual job he's doing terms, I mean... You don't need me to sit here and tell you what he's done to buy Leverkusen and took them from 17 last season, got them into Europe and, and a remarkable run. Currently sitting 10 points top, clear of the Bundesliga against the, you know, the perennial champions by Munich. He looks set to dethrone them. Like it's just an incredible job he's doing. I mean, the football they play there as well is remarkable. He looks like he's adaptable in, in managerial terms too. He he's young, he's fresh, he He's got bright ideas. It looks like he speaks brilliantly. There's no surprise about that either. So I just think we're looking looking a gift horse in the mouth a little bit when it comes to Xavier Alonso. It feels like the stars have aligned somewhat with the timing and all that sort of stuff. So he might think differently. He might be you know, more inclined to do another year by Leverkusen and earn his stripes ever so slightly more. But I think as upset and as heartbroken as I was and still am that Jürgen Klopp will leave the football club, when you caveat that with the potential of someone like Xabi Alonso, who again looks to be one of the brightest young managers in world football, who's won the Champions League already at Liverpool Football Club, it just feels it feels like the biggest no-brainer of all time. And for that not to happen would be, listen, I think we'd all come to peace with it and we'd all find a way. And whoever was to be the manager, we'd obviously back them to the hilt. However, Xabi Alonso, it just it just has to be, honestly. And I've had many conversations with many people now, and one with the coach's voice recently as well, Tony Hodgson, who was brilliant. And we did like a whole breakdown on sort of the tactical elements and all that sort of stuff. And why is he the right man? And what makes him so special as a manager, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then you, you boil it all down and you say, like, what's the answer with your head? And it's Xabi Alonso. So what's the answer with your heart? And it's still Xabi Alonso. So you mentioned a minute ago, all roads lead to Michael Edwards. It's very similar to Alonso. You can sit here for 10 minutes and talk about how he gets his by Leverkusen side play and how fun foot they are, the use of the full-backs, and it's really exciting to watch, and it's full throttle. And I'm also quite excited by adding an element of sort of more possession-hungry football, because I think with everything Jurgen Klopp's given us to go off piste ever so slightly, and that fight against adversity, the mentality monsters, the never-say-die attitude, I love all of that, and... The heavy metal football element of Liverpool has been just joyous. I've absolutely adored every moment of it. But I'd be lying if I said there wasn't a little piece of me that was quite excited by something different, some fresh ideas. And a guy who's going to come in and say, you've got all that, harness all that. But also, watch what happens if we keep the ball for 20 minutes and stuff like that. That The mixture of the two, the hybrid of the two, makes me wonder what we can become. So someone like Xabi Alonso feels like the perfect man to sort of bring both elements together. So I suppose in a, in a sense, it's similar to like what City are doing where they just, they dominate possession of the ball and sort of just cut teams out completely. They they control the game. It's like that kind of aspect of it. Is that what you'd like to see a bit more? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and I think, listen, I don't want Liverpool to become Manchester City far from it. I'd like us to keep mm. both factors. That, that like I say, that fast transition, that 
we're going to come at you with absolutely all guns blazing because Man City can be a little bit, it's death by a thousand passes, isn't it? Ultimately, it can be a little bit, yeah, yeah. A bit slow, a little bit turgid at times. And listen, mm-hmm. they, they that's fine. They win a lot of games of football, let's put it that way. But I don't find them anywhere near as exciting to watch as Liverpool. I think the feral nature of us and that, that full philosophy, that full intense nature, the way we play. And a lot of that is down to Anfield and wherever that, but even away from home at times, we can be really, really on it. And it just, it's fire. It's all guns blazing, as I say, it's a joy to watch. I think a, a blend of the two of them is a really exciting proposition. And when you factor in what the job Alonso is doing now, it looks like he's got his by Leverkusen and side playing in a very similar manner to that. And also on Alonso as well, like when you look at the, the the inspirations he's had for managerial terms, the managers he's worked under, like that's a who's who of yeah. managers. And if he's taken pieces from all of them, he's onto something very, very special. And again, you don't want to sort of get carried away with managers because who knows what happens. You, you're only ever sort of one bad job, one bad run away from being a bit of a forgotten man in managers' terms, it feels like. But right now, Alonso's trajectory is just superb. And when you factor in the type of person he is, the people he's worked under, like I say, he feels like he's ready to really explode. And I said this really early on in Liverpool's sort of search or quest for a new manager, actually. The the hunt feels much like one of our transfer dealings, whereby we sign someone more often than not who's on a really steady trajectory, but they're just about to explode onto the scene. And I think we'll do something similar in managerial terms. And that leads you to the names are linked with. Alonso, Ruben Amarin, even a little bit of Julian Nagelsmann, although I'm not fully sold on him. But I think Liverpool will be more inclined to appoint someone like a Nagelsmann than a, a Carlo Ancelotti, if he was available, for example. I mean, well, you, you mentioned there managers who are on the sort of precipice of becoming great. And the, the Brendan Rodgers one, for example, felt like that where, you know, he did well at Swansea, not so much at Watford, but, you know, he was up and coming. He came to Liverpool, which was his first big job sort of thing. And you know, it didn't quite work out at the end, but he had moments. He started off really well and then just pieced out towards the end. Now, you mentioned there Ruben Amarim, and he's a coach who, by all accounts, he seems to be like an excellent fit. He has qualities that would really suit Liverpool. And he's... I think he's sort of becoming the second choice behind Alonso. Is there a sort of argument to be made that because of the spotlight on Xabi Alonso, because of the fact that Bayern are coming in for him, they might ramp up the price and all these other factors, that maybe Ruben Amarin is someone that we should be considering a little bit more than he is being considered, just in case? Yeah, quite possibly. Um, and I think, I think from, listen, from a purely FSG standpoint they probably are considering Ruben Amarine equally as much as Xabi Alonso although again all the noise seems to suggest that even from their point of view Alonso is definitely the front runner I think obviously it's been a very data driven data led approach to putting the new manager they're not fans of the Liverpool football club which is probably a good thing to be honest with you because they make they would make rash decisions time and time again if that was the case um mm-hmm. but yeah I think we're guilty sometimes of of romanticizing decisions and things to do with the Reds because it means so much to us. Of course it does. And again, I've been trying my hardest to take a step back away from the Alondo situation and get loads of different perspectives and loads of different angles from people who really know what they're talking about. But every single conversation I have, even with people who aren't necessarily Liverpool inclined, the answer always seems to be Xabi Alonso. So that has only sort of reaffirmed my belief. However, I think... There's definitely an element of it's it's far from an easy job to follow Jurgen Klopp. And does there need to be a fall guy? I've seen people sort of mute that as a possibility. Do you need someone like David Moyes of Manchester United, for example, to come in and, and essentially do a bad job? And then you can follow him because that becomes slightly easier, I think it's fair to say. I'm not in that world. I think setting yourself up for failure for an amount of weeks, months or whatever it may be is only a, it's a bad thing, basically. Jurgen Klopp is going to leave the football club in an incredible, incredible shape. No matter what happens between now and in the season, he's not leaving us like they, Alex Ferguson left Man United. We are looking prime to do something very, very special whether it be sort of next year, the year after, look at the academy kids coming through and all that. So whoever the next manager is needs to be the guy, the absolute guy for the future and for years and years to come. Um, could be Amarin, could be Amarin. And I think Liverpool really like Ruben Amarin as well. Um, I don't know enough about him in terms of his sort of personality and stuff like that. I think 
the way he comes across, I've spoken to a couple of people from Portugal in the media, is very positive. I don't think he loves the limelight and loves the, the press conference elements of things. And you know, Klopp isn't a huge fan, so don't see that being too much of an issue. But again, they all, and I'm going to keep doing this no matter how much we talk about managers, they all pale into insignificance compared to Xabi Alonso. Like, yeah. I struggle. Again, I spoke to somebody from The Athletic recently to sort of spin off ever so slightly, and I asked him, what are the cons of Xabi Alonso? And the only cons he could really come up with were time-related. The fact that he hasn't been mm-hmm. doing it that long, and he's got that lack yeah. of experience, the lack of working with sort of real superstar footballers. So, therefore, mm-hmm. none of it's his fault. Like, there are no cons at the moment to Xabi Alonso. It's just the fact that he's not been a manager for that long. So, I struggle, no matter how much I want to talk, or people try and talk about Amarim or whoever else, I struggle to forget that Xabi Alonso is the answer to this question. Well, I mean, you mentioned the time there, and, like, just to take it back to Pep for a second, his first job after Barcelona B was Barcelona, where he did the treble. Like, it's it's not the time that matters, so to speak. It's the man who's doing it, and Alonso, like you said, seems to be the perfect fit. Uh, I just want to take a quick second just to go over, guys, really quickly. If you haven't already, go buy your tickets for the Redmen TV show in London, Wednesday, the 24th of April. It's the Klopp Celebration Tour. Tickets are on sale. Redmen TV, Ticketmaster, go tune in, go buy them. I'm sure everyone who's already going is looking forward to it, so make sure you get involved now while you still can, and tickets are still on sale. Um, Just going back to it then, so moving on from the manager slightly, or sort of keeping it in the same bracket, but moving on to a bit more of the players. Now, this season we've been seeing Klopp's kids, the Cop kids, these young lads who have been coming through, you know, Dan's, uh, Scanlon, Bradley, McConnell, Clark, all these young lads come through. Whoever the new manager is, he's going to have this young crop of top possibly generational talents come through. It might be a bit of a stretch, but I don't care. The Liverpool players, they've been great. Whoever comes in, they need to be able to work with these kids and sort of get them playing the way he wants to. Is Alonso, in your eyes, and I know you, I, I feel like I can already tell the answer, but is he the best man to be working with these young lads to get them playing the way that he wants? Yeah, I would say so, 100%. And again, I, I, I'm trying not to, I'm trying to be as objective as possible and not just have Jabby Lonzo tinted glasses on, but I'm finding it difficult. Um, I think he is, yeah. And it gets. Funnily enough, one of the conversations I had recently about Alonso and why he's doing such a good job by Leverkusen, and, and part of the answer was that he's obviously revered by the youngsters in this by Leverkusen squad right now. Like they remember him, a lot of them remember him as a player. They might grow up watching him, some of them, and to learn and to be coached by somebody like that who's been there, seen it, done it, won it all, must have been a remarkable feeling because you're not just learning from what appears to be a very, very exciting young manager. You're working under somebody who's, like I say, who's won absolutely everything there is to win in the game. So he's speaking from experience. When he's telling you the way he wants you to go about your business, that's because he's been there and he's played it himself, like he's lived it. So I think the same applies for for a lot of these youngsters in Liverpool's academy right now, like to work under somebody like, you know, and again, Steven Gerrard would have been like the perfect man for this, had his managerial career gone slightly differently, I think it's fair to say, because you look up to these people and to have the opportunity to, to learn from them and to, to soak in everything that they want to tell you and they want to teach you would just be absolutely incredible. Like imagine you were Bobby Clark, for example, or James McConnell, one of the young midfielders now at Liverpool, and someone like Xabi Alonso was coaching you how to go about playing a game. You'd be like, God, this is this is like pinch me moment sort of stuff. And <laughs> these lads have already lived enough of them in recent weeks, I think it's fair to say. But yeah, I think Alonso's record with young footballers at Bayer Leverkusen is, is excellent as well right now. And obviously, mm. so should that be. He'd have worked with a crop of youngsters there. So yeah, I think he is. I think his record already proves that he would be the right man to to nurture and to really harness the talent that Liverpool appear to be producing right now from the academy. And there's some more to come as well. The academy has never been in a healthier position, certainly not in the past sort of ten years. I would say FSG's tenure. It's been it's incredible what's coming through right now. So yeah, Xavi Londo feels again like the perfect man to be able to get the best out of them. And it comes back to like. You know, he's not exactly been blessed with a huge transfer budget by Leverkusen. And their success hasn't mm-hmm. been built on that necessarily. It's been built on improving what he has at his disposal already. There's been some smart business in the mm-hmm. transfer market, of course, that has. But we're not talking about, you know, a, a 
a former Jose Mourinho, whereby he needs to buy the best talent to get success and stuff like that. We're not talking about Pep Guardiola in the same bracket as well. Xabi Lonzo will come in and I think he'll just build on the work that's already been put in place. The building blocks that are there, thanks to Jurgen Klopp and the staff and people around him. Xabi Lonzo feels like the right man just to pick up the mantle and say, OK, that's all perfect. I don't need to change much. And that's massively important for me. That continuity of plan and project is so, so crucial. And Xabi Lonzo wouldn't come in and rip things up and start again. It feels like he'd just carry on that baton. I mean, the last bit about manager then, like you mentioned there, that sort of continuation. And Klopp said that he was never going to leave if he felt we were in a bad position. And we're not. If anything, we've got, we're in a better position now, possibly, than we have been in a long time in terms of what's on the pitch. Is there a sort of sense of if Alonso was going to be our manager, for example, if he wasn't in a title race, if a season was a sort of teetering on a really, really important point, is there a chance that the announcement could have been made a lot sooner? But because of their situation currently, it's just not possible? I would say so. Yeah, I would say so. And I, Obviously, that's all kind of you know conjecture. It's a little bit if, but to maybe. Mm. But yeah, one of my first sort of realizations in the amongst all this conversation like when your your mind immediately goes from okay you and Klopp's leaving like my world's crashing down to who's going to be next and then you immediately kind of arrive at Jabby Alonso and then you go well what does that look like what is the point in Alonso how does that feel how does that happen mm -hmm. how do we make that a reality and straight away you go but it's probably not going to happen anytime soon because Bayern Leverkusen are currently on course to dethrone Bayern Munich so they're not going to want to unsettle that necessarily. And there's been a lot of conversations, obviously, in the German media and stuff like that about Bayern Munich being the front runners. And there's been a little bit of anger towards that from Bayer Leverkusen's camp mm. as well. And yeah. it's a really, it's treacherous at the minute. And I think Liverpool are, mm. are trying their best not to, not to upset that camp as well. And Javi Lonzo's camp will come into this as well as Bayer Leverkusen's. They're going to want to be fully focused on the task at hand. Liverpool are in them. Um, a better position than that, of course, because you know, other than the Europa League, we're not direct rivals to uh, Bayer Leverkusen right now. So any sort of noises coming from the Liverpool side of things, not helpful for Bayer Leverkusen, but not up against the team literally trying to hunt you down for a title. So it's slightly different. But yeah, I think we might have been living in a slightly different world. Had and it's, it's weird because you know, in the modern era, we have Jurgen Klopp for you know nine years now, necessarily or, or pretty much. Um, and so we haven't really lived in a world whereby what does appointing a new manager look like? So it's strange to sort of come to terms with it right now. But I do believe that had the situation been slightly different, Liverpool weren't chasing a quadruple and by Leverkusen weren't chasing a potential treble, maybe we could have said a little pre-announcement, oh yeah, we're going to appoint him middle of March. Let's put it that way. We might have said it and then he's coming at the end of the season and stuff like that. But because of what's going on, I just don't see a world whereby that's possible. I think that's a fair enough assessment. And like I said, we're, we're, we're going to move on from the sort of managerial side of things because we've got a squad of players who I think have done themselves and all of us proud this season. They've been absolutely superb so far. And one player who I think has been a bit of a figurehead and a target of both criticism and positivity is Darwin Nunez. He's someone who I've been a very avid supporter on this channel, on Red Men, on my own channel. Like I, I adore Darwin Nunez. Are we now starting to see the, not the finished article, but a player who's playing with pure confidence and has found his rhythm and system in this team? Yeah, I think it's fair to say we are. Um, I think the belief right now he has within himself and his own ability is it's massively enhanced from where he was at times last year. I think there's there's no two ways about it. And listen, I've been a huge Darwin Nunes fan since day dot essentially because it's clear to see all the, the tools, all the raw potential was there. He was just a little bit of a rough diamond. Um, and it felt like at times he was ever so slightly lacking in confidence. But I think the fact that he now knows he has the unwavering backing of Liverpool as a fan base, as a support system, has helped him massively. I think even the the inclusion of you know some more familiar voices and names, he's clearly got a very good relationship with Brexit McAllister. I think those sort of you know people would sort of overlook that and think, oh yeah, whatever. They want that, that that doesn't help, but clearly mm -hmm. it does. I think his understanding of what's required of him in the system and the understanding of the English language has definitely helped as well. We've seen that this season and he 
I remember watching him at Anfield when he was at, for Benfica, and honest to God, like he was untouchable that night, like absolutely untouchable. And it feels like we're getting somewhere towards. I actually don't think he's put in as good a performance as he did that night. I've never seen anything like it. He was remarkable, but we're definitely getting yeah. towards that Benfica version of Darwin Nunes now. And I, uh, it's really interesting because we've all seen how well he links up with Mohamed Salah, but in Salah's absence. It's almost like his mind's become ever so slightly clearer because it did feel at times like when Salah was on the pitch with him, his first thought may sometimes have been, okay, where's Mo Salah? Which is fine because it's Mo Salah. But with him not being there, it's been like, okay, I can't look for him now. So how can I affect the game in my own way? And he's been doing it in recent weeks. And again, with Salah returning, if Nunes can sort of find the balance between trying to feed Mo and looking after his own contributions, that would be ideal. But yeah, I think we're definitely seeing um, what we hoped we were buying in the first place. And ultimately, you know, the comparisons with Berlin Carlin didn't help last year, but they're very different players and we play in very different manners, as I mentioned earlier. I think Harland's perfect for Man City and I think Darwin Nunes is perfect for Liverpool because we need more from our front man. He can't just be mm. without doing a disservice to Erling Haaland. He can't just be this utter goal machine and just hangs around the box and just bangs in goals for fun. That's nice, of course. But the way Liverpool go about our business, we need a bit more. And Darwin Nunes provides that and everything else. He is, you know, all the cliches, he's chaos, he's a nightmare for defenders. But he's ours and we love him. And as I said a moment ago, right now, he is absolutely firing and it's just a joy to watch. No, it's an absolute, I I said last night, it's a privilege watching Darwin play when he's playing like that because he does things that just, like that's that first goal was unbelievable and he's really is stepping into his own. Um, just before we move on to the last part, I just want to get your thoughts on uh, Cody Gakpo because I know he's a player you think very highly of. Is this rise to prominence of Darwin Nunez, is there a chance that this could possibly affect Gakpo's position in this team? Interesting one. Um, yeah, I am a fan of Cody Gakpo and that hasn't really wavered in recent times. It's been hard at times to remain so positive about him because I've said loads this season, really, like he's a bit of a victim of his own versatility. And my stance on that has altered somewhat in recent times because all of a sudden it's gone from being that to being, he's probably sort of like third or fourth in the pecking order on quite a few different positions now. And that's not a particularly healthy place to be, I wouldn't have said. Um, he gets his minutes, of course he does, because it's often injury-induced. But he is struggling. There's no two ways about that. He's struggling to nail down a place in the team, and he's struggling to contribute towards games time and time again. And I think it's a new sort of a sample size of the past few weeks. I think he's been okay. Um, his end products left a lot to be desired at times as well. Like he's done a lot of good work. There was a game recently where he, he tracked back miles and won the ball back deep, carried it off at the pitch, and then his shot was wayward. And it's like he's had a couple of those type of moments. I mean, there's one in the game last night as well against Sparta. So yeah, just just not at it. We, we just spoke about Darwin Nunes you know, being very much at it and being definitely fine. I think Gakpo is just going through a little bit of a crisis of confidence somewhat and that could be because of the fact he doesn't feel like he's got a settled place in the side and he has been moved from pillar to post a little bit. I mean, even last night he ended up playing right wing because you've got Diaz in his A1 position. Darwin Nunes is probably in his A1 position right now as well and Gakpo's kind of the fall guy and he's just like, oh, we need someone to play right wing because Salah can't and Harvey Ellis in midfield. Mm -hmm. Do you mind Cody and he does it and it's a testament to him that he does it and he does his best version of it but he's probably played in four different positions now this season and at no point I, I would say he's played consecutively in three or four games on the spin in any of them that's not great is what I'd say what that is is really good for, for a squad point of view and Klopp must love the fact that he has this this Swiss army knife of a forward to call upon and to drop him into game. That's amazing. Like more power to him. But for Cody Gakpo personally, we're not seeing the best of him because of it for me. And I said earlier, I think I was a huge Bobby Firmino fan. Like anyone who's ever seen me talk will know that I adored Bobby Firmino. And I think there's a lot of Firmino's qualities in Cody Gakpo. We've certainly seen that when he first arrived at the club. It felt like Firmino 2.0. When he was doing what he was doing in that false nine, he could drop deep, he could bring people into play. But also he had a bit more pace, a bit more power, and it looked like a bit more 
prowess in front of goal as well. So I was like, God, this guy could be a joke. He's got all the Firmino stuff whilst also banging goals in for fun. Like, we've got an absolute winner here. But for various reasons, I've already mentioned, it hasn't really clicked into gear yet this year for Cody Gappo. And we're running out of time for it to do so, of course. And that's not to say he won't still contribute along the way and he'll get minutes and he'll chip in with stuff. Of course he will. But I am slightly concerned about where Cody Gappo fits into this squad in the long run. Because, and again, I'll come back to it. You know, Jota fully fit. He's definitely heading the back and all the centre forward. Likewise, Darwin Nunes, you've got... Diaz from the left. Joss is having a conversation on the left as well. And I just don't know where he gets his consistent minutes from. And clearly that's impacting the way he's playing. Well, I think that's fair enough. And I, like I said, Cody Gappo is one of these versatile players. He's a victim of his own versatility in a sense. Uh, so I can understand it completely. Um, we're going to go on something a bit more fun. Not as not quite as fun as a Nottingham Forest away end. It's just a bit of sort of a couple of little bits. Uh, so basically all I'm going to do is I'm going to name a few players. I think I've got like eight or nine in front of me from Liverpool's history, recent history, distant history, some good, some not so good. You just give a one-word answer or just a sentence, tell me what you think of them, and then we've got one more question after that. So I'm going to start off with Andre Voronin. God, that's a star. Um, Oh, my God. Um, No, I'm sorry, I can't. Um, Yeah, (laughs) not, not the answer to whatever the question was, he was not the answer, let's put it that way. Uh, Maxi Rodriguez. Oh, running down the wing for me. Um, hat tricks, if I had to give it one, because it just felt like certainly as he was about to leave, he just kept banging in hat tricks for a laugh. Obviously, one of Fulham. Love Maxi, absolutely love Maxi so much. Three signings in, I'd, I'd argue, Premier League history, to be honest. He's up there. Um, Craig Bellamy. Golf swing, is that acceptable? Um, yeah. <laughs> Problematic would be the one word I'd describe Craig Bellamy as. I, I quite liked him as a footy player, if truth be told, yeah. but just felt like there was always an issue, uh, and obviously as proven in the new Camp that time. But we should give him special mention for that goal in the in the new Camp. So, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Momo Sissoko. Love Momo. Absolutely love Momo. So, part of the best midfield in the world. So, what do you want? Mm. Yeah. I'm happy with that. Um, Robbie Keane. Um, yeah, I, I want to use the words. I want to use the word misfit, Robbie Keane, or, or sort of mm. right player, wrong time a little bit. Robbie yeah. Keane. Yeah, it just felt like it could have been something special, uh, but ultimately left a lot to be desired. Uh, and my sort of one memory of Robbie Keane, he scored was against Arsenal. And we had that kit on, like the grey top and the red shorts, just completely didn't work. And that kind of summed up Keane's time at Liverpool a little bit, just a little bit mm. not right. Yeah, often getting played on the wing and just, it just wasn't yeah, like said, yeah. right player. Strange. Yeah, right player, wrong time. Um, just a couple more. Uh, Yossi Ben Ayoun. Love Yossi as well. Um, underrated, I'd describe Yossi Ben Ayoun as. I think we forget Absolutely. how good Yossi Ben Ayoun was for Liverpool at the time. Brilliant player. I said it with Jay Pearson in the last episode. Um, I think Yossi Ben Ayun is one of those players who, in a Klopp system, he'd absolutely thrive. Yeah, yeah. well, um, did not shirk putting a bit of effort in, like a work or similar to the kite in that yeah. sense as well. Like, absolutely put a shift in every time he got on the pitch. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've got two more. Uh, Bolo Zenden. Special place in my heart for Bolo. Speaking about Cody Gappo, he was the first person to speak to me about Gappo. Um, so, I really like Bolo Zenden. Um, oh, well. Yeah, I, listen, his Liverpool career never really hit the heights. As a footballer, he had an incredible career at Barcelona and Chelsea and Liverpool. Like, it's not bad. Uh, not a bad clutch of clubs to have been at. But from a Liverpool point of view, um, yeah, flattered to deceive, I think. And then we've got one more on this list before the last question. And you've already touched on him, so this is your chance to sort of give him the love and praise that you think he deserves. Roberto Firmino. The best. The best in the world. Honestly, like, I cannot... <laughs> express how much love I have for that man and being part of and making a documentary on his time in Liverpool here at Redmen was one of the greatest things I've ever done in my life quite frankly having getting to go to Hoffenheim and speaking to people that knew him and 
to feel the love that people had for him over there within the football club, from his teammates to sort of the staff in the round, it was just, it was special. Like, it was really, really special. And I'm so glad as well because, you know, without meaning to go all soppy, like they say, never meet your heroes a little bit. And Firmino was one. Like, I just love watching him play. The way he went about his football, just that freedom with which he played and the, the mm. manner and the unselfish nature of him as well, I love. Like, he'd run through big walls for his teammates, you know what I mean? Like, and he, you know, he wouldn't because he's Brazilian and he was better than that. But he didn't care about the limelight and the headlines. If they came, great. Like, don't get me wrong, he had his fair share. But he was all about the betterment of the football club and the side around him. And anyone who's like that for me is a, is a big winner in my box. So, yeah, I was so pleased. Having, like I say, adored for me, you know, from afar to get sort of up close and personal with people that knew him to sort of get that warmth back and to realise what I hoped was kind of true as well was really special. So, yeah, unbelievable, unbelievable footballer. Now, we've got one more before we shoot. Uh, and this is for you. Again, I asked this to Chris. Uh, I've asked this to a couple of people on this channel. Uh, I want you to describe for me your perfect trip to Anfield. So it's what you're doing before the match, who we're playing, what you're doing after the match, the song being sung, the kit being worn, your perfect trip to Anfield. Okay, interesting. Um, nice. So, uh, and people may or may not know this, um, so not potentially a bit of breaking news for some, but for some people might not be aware. I don't drink so at all i'm one of those weirdos um don't drink in the slightest so <laughs> my most people probably say oh go to this pub or that pub i probably wouldn't if truth be told um i'd probably go to costa <laughs> on the way to be honest grab myself a coffee and have that on the way down to the ground put it in a bin responsibly just before walking into anfield we'd be playing oh, we'd be playing man city in this game and it would be it would be feral like i want sunday to be yeah. it'd be really naughty in there it'd be gritty it'd be hostile it'd be all the good anfield stuff and i was lucky enough to be there a few times when we beat them um including mm -hmm. that champions league night including the four three game as well it'd be similar to that i was at the barcelona game as well like atmosphere wise i'd be looking for something like that in terms of song being sung and um, poor scouts to tommy is the elite of the Liverpool football songs and chants for me. So that would be getting rung around Anfield on numerous occasions. Uh, and the kit was your one, wasn't it? The kit. Ooh, I'm a bit of a retro kit fan. So something like you've got on now, mm. I've got that badge tattooed on my forearm. So it might be that no, kit. Well. Uh, yeah, it might be on that kit. Um, was there anything else you needed? This is where you, so like who were playing, Kate, oh, what are yeah. you doing after the match? Oh, uh, after the game. Just... Okay. After the game, we're going to Hotel Anfield uh, and we've just beat them 3 0. And it was as comprehensive as it gets. Pep Guardiola has lost his mind. He is human. Um, <laughs> and yes, yeah, Salah scores. Could it be any player from past and present? Yeah. Anyone. Okay, it's your yeah. dream scenario. Okay. Like, okay. Yeah. So Salah, Salah, Bobby. And Gerard have scored. Mm. We went 3 0. It's bouncing, absolutely bouncing. Like, we properly sent them packing. And then I probably just wander up to Hotel Anfield and just revel in the next four or five hours. Not too late, because again, I'm a non drinker. And I get myself to bed um, <laughs> and just wake up happy, happy man. That was the most, I think that was the most responsible answer I've got on yeah, this so far. And listen, I know I'm aware of it. it's ever so slightly boring. <laughs> I, I can have fun, trust me, I can still have fun. But yeah, I'm not, my, my olden days, anyone who knew me 10, 15 years ago, they'll be thinking, what are you talking about? Because it was slightly different back then. But these days I'm a mm. lot, yeah, I'm a lot calmer, let's put it that way. Uh, well, if, if you want to see the Red Men have fun, as I said before, make sure you tune in, or not tune in, sorry, buy your tickets to the event in London, 24th of April on the Wednesday. Uh, it's the Jurgen Klopp for Well Tour, so make sure you get onto that. And as I say, if you want to see the guys make content on a daily basis that's up there with some of the best content creation on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to Red Men TV and subscribe to Red Men TV Plus. It's, it's worth it, honestly, it really, really is. If you want to see more of Dan, which I'm sure we all do, make sure you go subscribe to it. Uh, Dan, any parting words just before we shoot off, mate? No, mate, absolute pleasure. Um, thank you so much for, for doing that. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's nice to talk all things Liverpool. As I, it never gets boring, this job, I found. I'm really lucky to do what I do, um, <laughs> I'll be honest. And I mentioned off air, I'm off to speak to, like, it feels at times, like, it's mad. I've said this to numerous people, I'll just quickly, before we go, like, sometimes I'll do something, like, I speak to Dirk Kite or Lucas Lee or whatever, 
And yeah. like people hearing work would be like, oh, you did that. So, you know, have a, have a few hours off. That's really like, oh, yeah, that was work. It doesn't feel like work most of this. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you're interviewing people that you've idolized and look up to during your childhood and you absolutely adore them, you don't feel like you're working. So I'm really lucky to do what I do. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for your time and having me on. It's been a pleasure. No, thank you for coming on. And as I said, your work is phenomenal. What you're doing is you're living the dream of a lot of people like myself, but you're a credit to it. So thank you so much for coming on. Everyone, please make sure to hit like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, and make sure you go check out the latest episode with Jay Pearson on the Expert Analysis Series. And make sure you tune in every single day, 7.30 p.m. UK time for the daily streams. Thank you very much. And we will see you in the next episode of Expert Analysis.